Hi, I'm Martin Swetman, and in this video I'm going to continue my review of the Younger Dryas Impact Debate Research. Now so far we've covered the published research from the original Firestone paper in 2007 through to the end of 2014 in the last video. So now that we've reached 2015, I think it's worth just taking stock of where we are. Um, the, the Comet Research Group in 2007 proposed a cosmic impact as the trigger for the Younger Dryas Mini Ice Age nearly 13,000 years ago. And that lasted over a thousand years in the Northern Hemisphere. And they claimed it contributed to changes in human cultures across the globe, such as the end of the Clovis culture in North America, uh, as well as megafaunal extinctions on several continents. And so far, the evidence we have seen very strongly supports their claims. The platinum spike in the Greenland ice is especially important because of its timing is so close to the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling within the resolution that can be achieved with ice cores. So there seems little doubt they are correct. And now we have around 15 sites across three continents where evidence for a cosmic impact such as nano diamonds and impact spherules is found and dated closely to the same time. The argument that these signals result from a series of unconnected cosmic impacts over the span of a few hundred years is extremely unlikely because there's only one major platinum signal in the Greenland ice. Also, multiple independent cosmic collisions are statistically extremely unlikely. And there is no evidence that these signals were generated by volcanism. Claims that such an event is highly unlikely are wrong because they fail to take into account the latest astronomical observations. These show it's extremely likely a giant comet has been orbiting within the inner solar system for perhaps several tens of thousands of years and gradually decaying to produce the massive zodiacal dust cloud we currently observe, as well as lots of large correlated comet fragments embedded within the Torrid meteor stream. On this basis, an event like the Younger Dryas impact is, is entirely expected. Indeed, we should find lots of evidence of other events like it over the past few tens of thousands of years, although they might not have been quite as large. So given all of this evidence, I think the case for a massive cosmic impact around 10,800 BC or so is now effectively proven. The lack of any obvious crater is not really a problem because a massive crater is not needed by this scenario. It's entirely possible that we're looking at a swarm of cosmic airbursts. On the other hand, it's also entirely possible that a large crater remains hidden on the seabed or under an ice sheet, for example. We've also seen clear evidence for significant human population bottlenecks in North America, at least around 10,800 BC. Now, whether this means the impact wiped out the Clovis culture is a contentious issue. Until now, one group of archeologists has been using radiocarbon dating evidence to suggest the change in population and culture was gradual. The problem with this is that the large uncertainty associated with those radiocarbon measurements. On the other hand, if we go by the stratigraphy, i.e. if we relate archeological finds to the base of the so-called Younger Dryas Black Mat, where it exists, then it does seem to support a catastrophic end to the Clovis culture. However, we've so far seen relatively little evidence produced by the Comet Research Group supporting claims of megafaunal extinctions at this time. Instead, uh, for this kind of evidence, we can look to the 2008 paper by Vance Haynes, which summarizes a lifetime of archeological research into this question. So let's just remind ourselves what he said. Okay, so here is the uh, abstract to his 2008, uh, yeah, 2008 paper. Um, you can stop the video and read that. And it's very clear that he thinks that there was a catastrophic end to the megafauna, at least in North America. There's also this paper, which is not part of our bibliography by Faith and Sorovel, which claims uh, a similar kind of dramatic end to the North American megafauna. So it's in the abstract, they claim uh, the extinction chronology of North American Pleistocene mammals therefore can be characterized as a synchronous event that took place uh, well that effectively is at the younger dryas um, the ons at the onset of the younger dryas plus or minus about a thousand years 
Results favor an extinction mechanism that is capable of wiping out up to 35 genera across a continent in a geological instant. So it seems to me then that by the beginning of 2015, the Comet Research Group has practically proven their case. A massive cosmic impact clearly occurred around 10,800 BC, whose effects spanned several continents. They only need to dot the I's and cross the T's on the issue of human population and culture changes and megafaunal extinctions. We can expect such a large cosmic impact, large enough to have triggered a mini ice age, to have significant effects like this. It, it makes sense. But proving it beyond reasonable doubt is always going to be tricky. Probably archaeologists will fight over these issues for many years to come. However, it's worth noting the quality of research in opposition to the impact theory. As we've seen, most of, these re of this research appears to be quite sloppy in terms of data analysis and f uses frequently misleading comments. In some cases, it seems to be deliberately misleading. Now, I wonder, is this normal for this community? Because it isn't in mine, uh, chemical physics. I'm sure many of my colleagues in the research area I specialize in would be quite shocked by some of what's gone on in this debate. All right, then let's have a look at our bibliography. So here we go. Starting in 2007, we've come all the way down to now 2015 and uh, so we're about three quarters of the way through. Now in 2015 we've got four key papers so that's uh, this one by Andronikov uh, and Kennett and then these two are responses and that's a, a response back to those responses and then two more other papers by Van Hosel and Tyne Wilcox. So in this video, we're going to just have a look at these first two papers and the responses to them. So let's first have a look at this paper by Andronikov et al. And remember in the previous year, 2014, they found a, a small peak in platinum in a Russian lake bed at a level that was probably corresponding to the Younger Dryas impact. Now here they're looking at four lake beds in Lithuania and they use mass spectrometry to analyze the abundances of a wide range of elements, including um, platinum group elements. And if spikes in several of these platinum group elements are found, then they say this would indicate a cosmic impact. So here are the locations of the, um, the lakes that they are looking at in Lithuania. But first, let's have a look at this table, which shows measurements of the age of the sediments at the various levels in these four lakes. Now it's easy to see that for these two lakes, the dating of their sediments is very imprecise with uncertainties much greater than a thousand years. So these are not really going to be useful for us. And the other two lake sediment uh, that sampled, uh, their sediments are too old to be of interest for us. So that only leaves the Lopecale 2 site or lake. Let's have a look at the results for that lake. So here are the, the main results for this Lopakai, I can't pronounce it, site. Um, we're mostly interested in the plot on the right, which shows the platinum group elements, as these elements are associated with cosmic impacts. Now, so these are measurements with depth. This is the depth axis. And this is the measurement of the abundance um, a relative to normal crustal abundances. So we're looking for uh, values in excess of one. And particularly we're looking for strong peaks in excess of one. And as you can see, what we instead have are these, uh, a couple of broad humps rather than sharp peaks. And there seems to be two of these. Uh, one following the supposed onset of the Younger Dryas um, period and then another uh, near the end of the Younger Dryas period. Now the authors argue that this data is inconclusive regarding the Younger Dryas impact event because these peaks are not very clear. And I agree with that. We can't really make any strong conclusions either way about the Younger Dryas impact event from this data. So presumably if the Younger Dryas impact event took place, as we now expect, these lakes were not very near any of the air bursts or impacts. So let's just move on to the next paper. 
So our next paper is a, another one from the Comet Research Group, and uh, here they're trying to refine the age estimate of the Younger Dryas impact event using all the available data from dozens of sites across four continents. And as you can see, they arrive at a date of 12,785 calendar years BP within 50 years at 95% confidence. So that, that equates to uh, 10,835 BC plus or minus 50 years. Now for those interested in Gebekli Tepe, I showed in the previous video how Pillar 43 at this ancient site, which is thought to memorialize the Younger Dryas impact event, can be interpreted as providing a date of 10,825 BC plus or minus 75 years. So that agrees very well with this estimate here, and I actually showed this paper in that video. Now to arrive at this age estimate for the Younger Dryas event, the Comet Research Group used the, the sophisticated Bayesian statistical modeling approach that we've seen before. They, here they are applying that method to all of the Younger Dryas boundary sites where impact evidence has been found. So this is a much more comprehensive study. But remember, this approach doesn't prove the event happened. Instead, um, it's assumed the event did actually happen and then we ask what date range is most consistent with the available data. Now this graphic is their main result and it shows the estimated age distributions for all of the Younger Dryas boundary layer sites and compares them with independent age estimates for the onset of the Younger Dryas cold period up here. That's what all of these different measurements are in this section. So these are taken from uh, uh, ice cores and lake sediments and, and so on. Now they have split the Younger Dryas boundary sites into several different groups, a high quality group, medium quality and low quality groups. Uh, but actually there is, as an error here, they've got Lake Hind here in high quality group, whereas in fact in their text it's mentioned in the medium quality group. Now in each case, the light gray distribution that you can see in the background is the modified age distribution for that site. So modified by the Bayesian statistical analysis. And the dark gray distribution is the age estimate of the Younger Dryas event. So this is a nice graphic as it compares all the different sites, but it glosses over a lot of complex or many complex issues which don't seem to be explained either in the text or in the supporting information. So for example let's look at Lake Hind which should be in this section but anyway let's look at Lake Hind. We saw from the paper by Van Hosel, let's just bring that up, we saw from the paper by Van Hosel that there is a single radiocarbon measurement from the black mat at Lake Hind that appears to be too young by uh, several hundred years uh, with quite a, quite a small range or uncertainty range. So it looks to be inconsistent with the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. And yet when we look at the final result in the paper, we see the tail of this modified distribution at Lake Hind is now consistent just about with the modelled age of the Younger Dryas impact. So what's going on here? Well, this is what happens if we insist that Lake Hind is consistent with the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. The software making calculations has drastically modified the Lake Hind distribution to make it consistent with the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. The question is, is this reasonable? And the answer, I think, is probably not. I think this is stretching things a bit far. The original Lake Hind distribution was nowhere near close to this uh, impact distribution. So what we should conclude from this is that either Lake Hind uh, was not created, the, the Lake Hind black mat was not created by the Younger Dryas impact, or that this single radiocarbon measurement is insufficient for estimating the age of the Lake Hind black mat. And given that the Lake Hind black mat contains similar geochemical evidence as all the other sites, probably it's the latter explanation 
That's correct. So the solution to this problem then is more radiocarbon measurements of the Lake Hine black mat are needed to build up a proper age depth model for that site. It's quite reasonable to expect a single measurement to be inadequate. Anyway, their final result, uh, taking all of the data together, is that the Younger Dryas impact occurred at 10,835 BC to within 50 years at 95% confidence. So what do the impact theories critics have to say about this result? Well, first we have this criticism from Vance Holliday. Remember it was Holliday and Meltzer that previously published a paper in 2014 saying the ages of the black mat sites are not consistent with a simultaneous event. And of course, this new paper by the Comet Research Group essentially rebuts their work. So we can expect them to be upset about this. So now uh, Holliday's entire line of reasoning in his criticism here goes along the following lines. He points out that there are problems with individual radiocarbon measurements at many of the sites and problems with some of the assumptions used to create the age depth models at these sites. Now this is all, that's fine. It's, it's fine to point out these problems and he's done that in, he did that in his 2014 paper. However, this is not what really matters and once again, Holiday seems to have missed the main point. The point is, if we correct these age depth models for any potential errors like this, does it make any significant difference? Are any of the age depth models suddenly inconsistent with the Younger Dryas impact theory when these potential changes in the underlying data points are corrected? And the problem for Vance Haynes is that he doesn't show this either in his earlier paper with Meltzer or here in his critical response. And this is essentially what the Comet Research Group say in their response to his criticism. They effectively say, well, so what? Show that any of these issues make any significant difference. Next up is Mark Boslow, another frequent critic of the Younger Dryas impact theory. His main complaint is that the new paper from the Comet Research Group doesn't take into account one of his own measurements on a single microspheral. Now he's brought this up before, and it's just nonsense. Put it this way, if his radiocarbon date for a single microspheral was used in the Bayesian analysis by the Comet Research Group, it would automatically be rejected because it's 13,000 years too young. It's obvious the problem lies with that single measurement. And again, this is, uh, this is essentially what the Comet Research Group say in their response to Bosley. Okay, so that's enough for this video. What we've seen is that nearly all of the Younger Dryas boundary sites are consistent with an impact date at 10,835 BC to within 50 years, which means that for those that aren't, which as far as I can see are based on just a single radiocarbon measurement, more data and proper age depth models should be collected. Okay, if you enjoyed that, then please take a look at my book and my blog, and in the next video, we'll take a look at the final two papers from 2015.